So today we have a super fun show all about the solar system. We're going to be taking you on a tour of the solar system. Um, if you have any special requests for things you want to see or any questions throughout, put them down in the comments. Um, Eli and I will be checking those periodically throughout the stream and we'll get to your questions as soon as we can. Um, and if we don't get to it right away, we will take some time at the end to answer any questions we didn't get to. Um, now, the software we're going to be using to do this tour is a little bit different than what you may have seen if you've come to our solar system tour at the planetarium. Um, it doesn't have quite as much detail, but it still shows a really fun view and close-up view of the planets in our solar system. Um, so I'm going to switch over to that. And, uh, all right. So the program we are using is called Open Space, and it is actually a free software um, that you can find at openspaceproject.org, I believe, or .com. I think I have it in the description of the video. Um, so this is something you could download yourself. I will say, though, that it does require quite a bit of computing power. Um, and so just be warned if you're interested in trying this out for yourself. So here we have a kind of look down at our solar system. We have the lines turned on, which are showing us the orbits of the planets. We can see that all of the orbits lie in pretty much the same plane. Our solar system um, is like a thin disk with all of the planets kind of within that thin disk. Um, and so we can see the inner planets, which are relatively close together. But as we keep zooming out and we start to see those outer planets, we see how much further apart these outer planets are spaced. And so the planets get really far apart once we get to the very outer edges of our solar system. So at the very center sits our sun, which is a star like any other star that we see up in the nighttime sky. It's just a lot closer to us, which makes it appear a lot bigger and brighter than all of the other stars. But since it is a star, that means it's a big ball of hot gas sitting there at the center of our solar system. All right, so we are going to head on to our first planet, and Eli is going to tell us a little bit about our inner planets. And so we're going to head over to Mercury. So with the uh, inner planets, um, it's kind of fun to make a little uh, Goldilocks analogy for um, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Um, we have the, uh, you know, too cold, uh, too little, uh, too much, uh, too hot, and then we have a just right. Um, so Mercury, um, even though it is kind of in the too cold spot, um, it does have a, a really large uh, degree of extremes. Um, since it's so close to the sun, um, well, actually, since it's so little, it doesn't have enough gravity to really hold down an atmosphere, um, and there's not much there to regulate temperature like we have here on Earth. So since it's so close to the sun, the side that's facing the sun is about 800 degrees Fahrenheit around there, um, which is incredibly hot and scorching uh, and you know pretty devastating. So obviously we don't see much there except for a lot of craters from impacts um, that have happened uh, through millions of years. Um, but then the um, other side of Mercury, the uh, dark side, um, usually stays at about negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference from day to night on Mercury is about a thousand degree difference, which is pretty astonishing. Um, and that would make it extremely hard to have anything sustainable on the surface. You need to keep it consistently right on a balance point between those two. Um, and Mercury moves extremely fast, so that would be really hard to obtain as well. Um, another interesting thing about Mercury is um, where it gets its name from. So Mercury uh, to, the, uh, to the Romans was kind of the Hermes of the Greeks. It's the messenger god. Um, and so... When astronomers saw this planet zipping super fast around the sun because it's so close and it's being pulled by the sun's gravity so strongly, 
um, they deemed it the messenger because if it's rushing around so much, it's in a hurry. Um, it must have to uh, deliver some mail like the uh, the uh, mailman god uh, Mercury. So I think that's really interesting how it gets its name. Um, so now after Mercury, um, we can go to Venus, which is the second planet in the solar system. And this is the uh, this is the too much planet. Um, so Mercury had too little of an atmosphere, um, and that led to some adverse conditions and made it practically impossible to have anything there. Um, Venus is um, the same story, but for a different reason. It has way, way, way too much of an atmosphere. So over millions of years, um, these volcanoes on Venus have outgassed and polluted the air so strongly that it has a, um, a runaway greenhouse effect, the likes of which we don't see anywhere else. I mean, Earth's greenhouse effect, uh, greenhouse effect is, uh, you know, kind of pitifully small compared to Venus's. Um, so on Venus, um, no matter which side you're on, if you're facing the sun or facing away, um, the temperature is consistently about 860 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that changes with altitude and things like that, but on average, it's about 860 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's actually hotter than the illuminated side of the planet that's closest to the sun, um, despite the fact that it's about twice as far away. Not exactly, but almost. Um, and so uh, we have actually, not we as the United States, but we as a human race, have had um, instruments go to Venus. And um, due to the extreme uh, temperature and pressure, um, the instrument lasted, I believe the number is 127 minutes before it was unusable. Um, so this, I believe it was a Russian instrument, um, kind of, it, it was just like a capsule. Um, it landed on the surface and um, the heat combined with the pressure of the atmosphere um, made it unusable uh, after uh, just over two hours. Um, another interesting thing about Venus's atmosphere is as well as creating a greenhouse effect that traps a lot of heat, um, it also puts a lot of pressure um, on anything that's in its atmosphere. So standing at the surface of Venus in the atmosphere is the same as being um, about a mile underwater, which is extreme pressure, a super, like you couldn't be there without any type of protective suit that's uh, completely deadly to humans. Um, and you, you know, obviously if a metal instrument has trouble withstanding the pressure, it'd be extremely hard to uh, outfit humans to withstand the pressure pressure so Venus not to mention uh, on top of that the clouds are full of sulfuric acid yeah and it rains acid so that's cool too <laughs> uh, yeah just not the coolest place um so ever since that probe uh met its fate there um i think uh we've just decided that we'll look at venus from the sky and that'll be about that because we don't want to waste millions and millions of dollars for 127 minutes of um, data. So, although I'd hesitate to say it was a waste, it gave us our only views from the surface. Yeah, I just, I think I could spend a million dollars elsewhere for a little more longevity. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. Um, so, and then the just right um, element of the Goldilocks story is um, Earth. Um, no, I'm not going to preach about environmental sustainability or anything like that but um earth really is this uh this just right planet um and we're super lucky to have it here um because it, it really houses all of the conditions that we know life needs um it has an atmosphere uh suitable for the temperatures that support liquid water and um it's uh it's really perfect and it's a it's a very delicate balance so we need to work hard to protect that balance so we still have a a, a suitable home here um, in the solar system. I know Elon Musk is pushing for Mars, but I think that's a, that's quite the feat. I think uh, Earth is kind of our home base for now. So I think we should try to protect it as long as we can. Um, so Earth um, is the third inner planet or the third terrestrial planet, the fourth and final terrestrial planet. Oh, well, do we want to go look at the moon real quick? Oh, yeah, we can look at the moon. I think it's, uh, I'm getting a little bit of lag time, so I don't know exactly what we're looking at. Um, yeah, but... we were on the Earth. I'm heading over to the moon right now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the moon, uh, probably one of my favorite things to talk about with the moon is um, the craters. Um, so we look at these dark spots on the surface of the moon, and um, some, you know, I've been told uh, it's, I think, pretty common to look at that and be like, oh, that's a crater from some type of impact. And um, while a lot of these dark spots are, you know, these little pockmark um, craters, 
um, a lot, lot of these darker spots, um, we call them Maria, um, they're the result of an impact, but it's not the uh, whole crater itself. Um, so if we look at a, you know, at any particularly large dark spot um, on the surface of the moon, um, that is the result of something crashing into the surface. Um, but what happened when it crashed into the surface is um, it kind of cracked it and opened it up just enough so that um, some, you know, lava and magma that was in the core of the moon um, could come to the surface. And when that magma comes to the surface, it spews out and it kind of covers over this area and then it dries. Um, and that is not unlike the basalt that we see on the uh, shores of Lake Superior. It's actually um, pretty much the same thing. This, this lava comes out, it dries, it cools, and then we have these dark spots. Um, and part of the reason we know that that's how it happens is because if you look at the uh, darker areas, you can see way fewer pockmarks than you can in the lighter areas. And what that leads us to believe is that these darker areas have been there for a shorter amount of time because it's like a it's like a blank slate when that lava came up it dried and then we had new flat land that wasn't covered in pock marks like the grayer areas are that haven't been exposed to that lava so um, we see much 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 fewer um, impact craters on these dark spots the maria um, and uh, that's how we know that uh, a part of how we know that uh, that's how that happens um, yeah. the name maria is also pretty fun um, because when people initially looked up and they saw those, they thought that they could be oceans. And um, Maria, I believe, is Latin for ocean. I could be wrong. For sea. Mm -hmm. For sea, yeah. Um, so uh, that's how we uh, get the name for those dark spots. So I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And uh, a pretty good analogy for these is like filling in um, puddles. That when that lava spread across, it filled in any craters that were previously there, just like we fill in potholes in the road. And it kind of smoothed out that area. Right. Yeah. So I think I think that's pretty cool. I don't know. That's interesting to me. A lot of craters also have cool names, like after famous astronomers. Um, I think that's interesting as well. Probably my favorite is Tycho. Um, but uh, okay. So after the moon, um, we can make our way to the fourth uh, terrestrial planet. Um, we can head to Mars really quick. And I also don't know what capabilities you have for looking at the surface of Mars. Um, but Mars is cool because it has two of the biggest features in the solar system. Um, yep. one Give of me them... just a second heading over there right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can't. We're still on the moon for me. So. Yeah, I'm, so for anyone um, who doesn't know, since this is a different system software than we use in the planetarium, I'm still adjusting slightly to the controls. Um, all right, we are here and we are pointed at Olympus Mons. So this is one of the um, biggest um, features of the solar system. This is Olympus Mons. It's the biggest mountain. Um, and it was once volcano, um, no longer active though. Um, and uh, it is about three times the height of Mount Everest. Um, so it's really, really tall, um, but it's actually not that steep or you know, as steep as you would imagine a mountain like that to be because its base is about the same size as Arizona. So it's this, absolutely massive mountain um, or you know inactive volcano um, with not that great of a pitch because it's so large at its base um, but it is like astonishingly large um, and uh, I think it's it's just kind of crazy to imagine um, a mountain three times the height of Mount Everest. Mount Everest is about 8,800 meters tall if memory serves I think that's approximately the number so I mean I'm just imagining a 25,000 meter tall um, mountain. That's that's just astonishing. Um, so, and the other um, extreme feature on the surface of Mars that I like to talk about um, is called Valles Marineris, um, and it is the largest um, canyon in the solar system. Um, so, this canyon, um, if you were to go from tip to tail, would stretch from New York City to Los Angeles, and that's a uh, that's pretty insane to me. It would just stretch across the United States diagonally. Um, that is pretty astonishing. I also like to highlight the fact that um, I think, and I've had people tell me that it looks like this. I think it looks like an Imperial Star Destroyer from Star Wars. Um, <laughs> Because you've got like the flat part that's like the, the the normal part of the ship, and then you've got the uh, kind of the outcropping on top that would be the bridge. So that's that's what I always think of when I look at Bellas Marineris. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't really, I can't outline it, but like, so you've got this 
the actual canyon part. And then you've got a little outcropping going out to the side, and that would be the bridge. I always think that's really funny. And I've had a lot of people tell me that they see it. So I always like to share that. Um, and, that's the first uh, time I've heard that one. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't actually see that until I was in the planetarium for the first time messing around with Uniview. But I saw it, and I was like, wow, that looks like a Star Destroyer. Um, so I was looking for Star Wars references. <laughs> um, I don't have anything else to share. Jessica, you want to All right. Here? Yeah. And so as we're kind of zooming back out from Mars, you'll see that it does have two moons. Um, Earth and Mars are the only two terrestrial planets that have moons. Um, Mars's moons are Phobos and Deimos, and they're not like ours. Um, they're very, very small. I lovingly call them lumpy space potatoes because uh, that's what they look like. Um, and they're basically captured asteroids, chunks of rock that just got a little bit too close to Mars, and Mars's gravity grabbed onto them, and they became moons. Um, so with that, we're going to turn our attention to the largest planet in our solar system, which is the planet Jupiter. All right. So if you've seen any of the images that have come from the Juno spacecraft, that's the spacecraft that's currently orbiting around Jupiter, you will have seen some of the most absolutely gorgeous pictures of Jupiter showing all of these details of these swirling clouds that we can see. A um, couple of notable features of Jupiter are the um, striped clouds that we see. We see these stripes of kind of orangish and whitish clouds all up and down. And these stripes are actually winds that are moving in opposite directions. And that's why we see so much kind of swirling and mixing around the edges of the bands, because you have these winds moving in opposite directions that are meeting and you get all sorts of cool stuff that happens. Now the, I would say most famous feature of Jupiter is its great red spot, which is a great red spot because astronomers are not always clever when coming up with names. But this great red spot is actually a hurricane, um, but not like a hurricane that we have seen here on Earth. Uh, this hurricane is about three times the size of the Earth and has been going on for over 350 years. Basically, as long as we have looked at Jupiter through a telescope, we have seen this storm, and we don't really know why it's lasted so long. Um, one of the kind of leading hypotheses suggests that since Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, maybe there's nothing to cause the storm to lose energy, because we know that that's how hurricanes here on Earth weaken when they run on ground. Um, and so maybe that's why, but we're, we're not sure. It's one of the things we're still trying to figure out. So Jupiter and the other outer planets are often nicknamed the gas giants, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but that's actually incorrect. That's a misnomer. Um, they are not mostly um, gas. Jupiter is actually mostly liquid hydrogen, and so it's more appropriate to call it a liquid giant instead of a gas giant. Now, Jupiter being a very big planet, has a lot of moons. We're not seeing all of them here, um, but it currently has, um, I believe the latest count is 79 moons. Um, most of them are like Mars's Phobos and Deimos. They're lumpy space potatoes. Um, asteroids and comets that have gotten a little bit too close to Jupiter and Jupiter just grabbed onto them. But Jupiter does have four larger moons that are known as the Galilean moons because it was the astronomer Galileo who first discovered them. Um, and I just wanna very quickly show you two of my favorite Galilean moons. The first is Io, which um, we have nicknamed the pizza moon because it, it looks like a pizza, right? With all of the yellows and oranges and these black specks. Um, but this is actually a world of volcanoes. All of these black specks that you're seeing are volcanoes. There are over 150 
active volcanoes, um, which makes it the most volcanically active world in our solar system, even more so than the Earth. And that's because it's caught in a tug of war with Jupiter and the other moons. And that's heating up the inside and driving all of these volcanoes that we see. Now, the other really interesting Galilean moon is Europa. Now, since Io is the moon of volcanoes, Europa is the moon of ice. It's covered in a thick layer of water ice. And you can see here, it's kind of cracked, almost looks like someone's been ice skating across the surface. But what we are most interested in is what lies beneath this icy crust. We think that there is a huge ocean of liquid water. There could be twice as much water in Europa's ocean than we have on the entire planet Earth. And that has us very excited and interested because one of the things we think life needs to develop is liquid water. And so where we have this world that has a lot of it, there is a chance that life could have developed here. And so this is one of our um, leading kind of places that we want to search for life elsewhere in the universe. All right. So turning our attention to the next planet is Saturn. Now, Saturn is most known for its beautiful rings. Ooh, did we sneak up on Saturn? Sorry, something has happened with this program. What's going on? There we go. Somehow we ended up right inside of Saturn. Not sure how that happened. Um, but Saturn is most known for its beautiful rings. Um, although it's not the only planet that has them, all of the outer planets have rings. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all do. It's just Saturns are the biggest and the brightest. And so they're the easiest um, to be seen through a telescope here on Earth. And so they were the first discovered and the um, most well known because of that. Now, even though the rings look solid, they're actually made up of millions of pieces of rock and ice that are all floating around Saturn that are probably pieces of moons that have been knocked off during um, impacts. Um, it's also possible that a comet got a little bit too close to Saturn and it's Saturn's gravity just ripped it apart. And all of those pieces now circle Saturn in this ring. All right. Our next planet is the one with the funny name, Planet Uranus. Um, and it does have the, the name that makes us all giggle. Um, but that's actually not its original name. When it was first discovered, it was named George. Um, the astronomer William Herschel is the uh, person who discovered this planet. He was an English astronomer. And so he knew that uh, if he named this brand new planet after the King of England, the King would like him. And so that's what he did. He named it after King George um, and named it Georgium Sidis, George's star. And the King loved that and um, gave William Herschel a lot of money for it. Um, however, all of the other astronomers who weren't English didn't like this planet being named after an English king. And so after a lot of years of debate, they decided to rename it Uranus, who is actually a Greek god. Um, and so that keeps it kind of in the pattern of the planets being named after Greek and Roman gods. Now, one of the interesting things about this planet is it's actually knocked over on its side. And we're not 100% sure why that happened, but we think uh, most likely is a big impact, something really big right into the planet and knocked it over. And that's why we see it knocked over today. All right, our last planet is the planet Neptune. 
So both Uranus and Neptune have this really pretty blue color to them. And that actually comes from methane that's in their atmospheres. Um, methane absorbs red light and reflects blue light. And that gives them the blue colors. And so here is our planet Neptune. Now, Saturn, like Jupiter, is um, mostly liquid hydrogen, so it's a liquid giant. Um, Uranus and Neptune are also full of kind of a slushy mix of liquid hydrogen and like solid water, solid ammonia, things like that. Um, so it's maybe more appropriate to call these ice giants instead of just liquid giants or maybe like slushy giants. Um, it gets really, really interesting in these worlds. So that is our last planet. Um, now, because I'm running the show and it's my favorite, um, we are gonna go see the planet, or we're gonna go see the dwarf planet, Pluto, because I love it. Um, I grew up with Pluto being a planet and it was my favorite planet growing up, um, although it is now classified as a dwarf planet. So what happened is Pluto is very small. It's actually smaller than our moon. But when it was first discovered, it was the only thing we knew of that was out here past Neptune. Then in the early 2000s, we started finding more and more things past Neptune that looked an awful lot like Pluto. And so astronomers had to make the decision, do we call all of these things planets, since that's what Pluto was classified as, or do we come up with a new category for these things that are like Pluto? And that's what they ended up doing, and that's what the dwarf planet category is. And Pluto is the largest of the dwarf planets, so he is now the king of his own little category, and that makes me very happy. Um, the other dwarf planets are Haumea, Maki Maki, Ceres, and Eris. And you'll see that Pluto does also have moons. It has five of them. Um, the largest is uh, Charon, which trying to zoom out to see. Where are you at, Karen? There it is. Um, Karen is pretty large for a moon. It's about half the size of Pluto. Um, and then the other four are um, Styx, Nyx, Kerberos, and Hydra. And so with that, I'm going to fly us back home um, while we check for any questions. Anything coming in, Eli? Yeah, we have two. Uh, the first, uh, Jenny Conrad asked, have other hurricane storms occurred on Jupiter in the last 350 years, or is it only the red eye storm that never seems to end? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so actually, let me pop over to Jupiter real quick, because um, I can show you that there are other storms there. Um, let me head over there really quickly. Um, and so you can see on Jupiter, there are other kind of circular features um, that are like the big red spot, but they're not red in color and they're a lot smaller. All of those are other little hurricanes. Um, these don't last as long and they're not the same color. We think that's because they're, they're weaker. We think because the great red spot is such a powerful hurricane that it's dredging up clouds from deep down in the atmosphere, which is what gives it that really reddish hint or reddish hue to it. Um, but yeah, Jupiter has lots of other hurricanes and storms, um, but these do seem to come and go much quicker um, and change much quicker than the Great Red Spot. And that's still a mystery that we have to solve is why. So yeah, great question. Um, another one that came through from Kathy Roller Harrington. Do we know what the big white mark is on Uranus? Um, let me head over there and see what you're talking about. Because I think you're talking about clouds. Um, so let me just hop over there real quick. Also, hi, Mom. Um, <laughs> So I'm assuming you're talking about this white streak right here. And yes, that's a cloud. Um, there are some really high 
clouds that you can sometimes see in its atmosphere. Um, and that's what we're seeing there. Neptune has a similar thing. Um, we just don't see them as often on Uranus, and we're not entirely sure why. So yeah, another good question. All right, any others? Nope, that's it. All right, well, let's switch back to our faces. Um, let me close this program out. Switch back to us. If you do have any comments or questions, um, now is a good time to get them in. Um, and while we're waiting to see if any others come in, let me give you um, a little bit of preview of what's coming up the next week. Um, so Saturday is a show that I'm very excited for called Furry Physics um, that one of my students, Lindsay, is putting together. And it's all about how animals and insects use physics to do things like navigate or walk on water or things like that. Um, she's found some really cool stuff. And so I'm, I'm excited for that one. Um, and then starting next week, our live streams are moving to a new time. Um, and so starting next week, they will be, instead of at 1 p.m., they will be on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. Um, that way, we know people are wanting to go out and enjoy the beautiful weather that we're now having. Um, and so we're going to move to evening shows. Um, and for next week on Wednesday... We're going to do a show all about spaceflight um, because Wednesday is the first crewed launch from the U.S. that we have had in a while. Um, I forget the exact number of years, um, but the Dragon um, capsule is launching with its first crewed um, mission, I guess. I, I'm blanking on what the words. Um, and so that's happening Wednesday afternoon. Um, and so that evening we'll talk about kind of what it takes to go into space and then give you kind of updates on what the crew is currently going through as they're making their way into space. Um, and Eli is going to be um, heading that one. We'll also, when it happens, there's going to be lots of live streams of the launches and stuff from NASA. We'll share those on our page so that you can watch the launch for yourself. And then on Saturday, I'm very excited, um, we're doing a show on aliens. Uh, and so we're going to talk about um, basically what it would take, we think, for life to develop somewhere else and some of the places that it may end up being and maybe what it could look like and that sort of fun stuff. Um, so all about aliens. And I'm putting that one together and I'm super excited for it. Um, so any new questions come in? No? All right. Um, what, we actually did get one. What is crude launch? Uh, but... Oh, a, a launch with um, a with people. Crude is what yes. I mean. C R E W E D. Yes. Yeah. Most um, we haven't ha launched a spacecraft with people from American soil in a while. Nine years. Nine years. I knew it was close to a decade, um, and that's just funding that got cut from NASA. Um, but thanks to SpaceX, uh, we're now doing that again. Um, and so that's, that's why we're very excited for this to happen. It's also the first private company to launch people into space, which is also a big deal. Um, so yeah, we'll talk all about that next week. But anything else? Nope, nothing else. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we hope to see you again um, either Saturday for Furry Physics or next week starting at our new time of 7 p.m. Um, so I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you later. Bye.